Hi, everyone. It is a pleasure to be here today on behalf of Google's University Relations team. It is my honor to introduce Jeff Dean. Jeff Dean is a Google Senior Fellow leading Google Research and Google Health. The research team that, Go that Jeff leads focuses on basic computer science and AI research and their use in important problem domains. Jeff's work has been integral to much of Google's infrastructure and developer as well as machine learning tools. Jeff holds a PhD in computer science from the University of Washington and a BS in computer science and economics from the University of Minnesota. He was awarded the 2012 ACM prize in computing and in is a member of the US National Academy of Engineering and the Academy of Arts and Sciences. And he is also a fellow of the ACM. It's my honor to turn it over to Jeff to tell us a little bit about the work at Google Research. Great, thank you very much, Megan. And uh, thank you, University of Texas for hosting me today. I'm very excited to virtually visit you. Uh, I'm afraid you know, the pandemic is such that I wasn't able to physically come to campus, but uh, you know, um, this is uh, the, the world of 2020. So uh, with that, uh, let me get started on the talk. So I'm going to be talking today about how deep learning can really be used to tackle some of society's most challenging problems. And I'm going to be presenting the work of many different people at Google. So some of this work I was involved in, some of which I think is just cool and I wasn't directly involved in, but I think you should hear about. It. So um, you're all probably aware of the sort of rise of deep learning as this incredibly powerful technique for solving interesting kinds of problems in computing and uh, perception and language understanding, many kinds of areas. Um, but really, deep learning is just the modern reincarnation of a fairly old set of concepts around artificial neural networks. This idea that you can have this collection of simple, trainable mathematical units organized in layers, and they work together. They build you know, higher layers build on interesting things that the lower layers have discovered, and they can work together to solve quite complicated tasks. So that idea has been around for 30 or 40 years, and it was a bit ahead of its time in that we really, at the time, needed um, sort of much more computational power than we, we actually had in the late 80s and early 90s in order to solve real problems, but they could show interesting results on very small-scale toy problems. Uh, when I was an, actually an undergrad uh, in 1990, I got really excited about neural networks when I learned about them in a the class, and I felt like they were the right abstraction for solving a lot of kinds of problems, and so I decided to do an undergraduate thesis on parallel training algorithms for neural networks, because I was convinced that if we could get the 64 processor machine in the University of Minnesota department uh, training neural networks instead of just one processor, it was going to be amazing. We'd have you know, 64 times larger neural networks, it would be great. Um, it turned out we needed about a million times more computation, not 64 times as much computation. Uh, but starting in about 2008, 2009, thanks to Moore's Law and general uh, improvements in computing performance, we started to suddenly have enough computational power to actually make neural networks solve real world interesting problems. And so uh, some of the problems that these, these uh, systems can solve are basic problems in computer vision. So like image classification, if you're given an image, can you predict one of a bunch of different categorical labels in that image, maybe 20,000 different categories, leopards and aircraft carriers and truck cars and trucks and bicycles. Uh, given the raw pixels of the image, a neural network uh, trained with deep learning-based uh, optimization algorithms can actually learn to predict what is the proper category for that image. Similarly, given an audio waveform, uh, this and a bunch of training data of the form of audio waveform and what someone is saying in that, the system can learn for a new audio waveform, an audio clip, to predict what is being said. How cold is it outside? That's speech recognition. The system can learn, given training data of the form of English sentence and French sentence, to take a novel English sentence and then predict what is the corresponding French sentence. Hello, how are you? Can be bonjour, comment allez-vous? Um, that's language translation. And you can even combine these modalities. So given the pixels of an image, can we predict not just the category, but maybe a short caption that a human might write for this kind of sentence, a cheetah lying on top of a car. Um, so the interesting thing about deep learning and why people are so excited about it is that the same underlying algorithms can be used to tackle all of these different kinds of problems and many more besides. Um, and so what previously used to be different subfields 
of, of research in computer science, things like computer vision and speech recognition, and machine translation, were all kind of separate domains with different kinds of approaches and techniques, now are sort of gradually being unified together into an approach that uses machine learning to tackle all of these problems, regardless of the modality of the problem. And I think that's pretty exciting. Uh, and you'll see why in the rest of the talk. So just to give you a sense of the progress in, in this field, uh, in computer vision in particular, um, Stanford runs a contest every year called the ImageNet Challenge, where you're given about a million training images in a thousand different categories. And then your goal is to take 10,000 different training images, test images that you've never seen before, and then predict which of the thousand categories that image represents. And in 2011, the year before anyone used a neural network for entering this contest, the winner got about 26% error. Um, and this task is pretty hard. So humans have about a 5% error because the thousand categories are fairly fine-grained and precise, and humans aren't necessarily that great at, say, distinguishing 40 different breeds of dogs and that kind of thing. Um, so human error is not zero. But if you look where we are five years later, thanks to deep learning, we're now at about 3% error, and we were in 2016, and it's gotten even better since then. So we've gone from basically computers being able to see, uh, not be able to see, to all of a sudden computers can actually see and perceive the world around them for vision, for speech recognition, for other kinds of perceptual tasks. And that has dramatic implications for a pretty wide variety of different things in the world. Um, so I'm going to frame the rest of the talk around this nice taxonomy of grand engineering challenges for the 21st century that the US National Academy of Engineering put together in 2008. This is sort of, they assembled a group of experts from different engineering fields and different scientific fields and said, what should we really, as a community, be thinking about solving in the next 100 years? Um, and I think, like you'd agree, this is a pretty nice list. It has like different kinds of focus, uh, ranging from making you know clean energy work to improving people's health, giving people better educational opportunities, uh, and so on. And I think if we tackled all of these things and solved them, that would that would be amazing progress. Um, I do think machine learning is going to be a major part of helping us solve many of these challenges. And so within Google Research, we actually have work going on on all the things listed in red. And I'm going to talk to you mostly about the things listed in boldface red at the bottom there. But uh, I think machine learning has this uh, potential to really change how we think about attacking a lot of different kinds of problems. So the first is restore and improve urban infrastructure. This is a fairly general purpose uh, thing. But one of the things that machine learning is now enabling is we're close to having real world functioning uh, autonomous vehicles, vehicles that can pick you up, take you from point A to point B safely by effectively understanding the world around them, understanding all the different objects involved in the surrounding environment, understanding the traffic laws, reading all the signs, reading the, the red light to say that's red, I better not go. Green light means I can go, except I'm turning left, so I shouldn't go yet. Um, understanding all those things uh, is actually enabled by the advances in perceptual machine learning uh, that have happened over the last uh, five to 10 years. And so this is a pretty exciting thing. And if you think about what the implications of autonomous vehicles might be if they get to widespread deployment, you know, we will actually radically change how we think about designing cities. You wouldn't need parking places or parking garages, you'd be able to just summon a car that's the right size whenever you need one. I need a one-person car now, and oh, I'm at Home Depot, so I need a, a big pickup truck autonomous vehicle so I can bring my two by fours home. Um, a lot of things would kind of be dramatically different about the world. Uh, another area that I think is going to be changed dramatically is the field of robotics. So most robotics work to date that's had a real impact on the world is mostly robots operating in relatively controlled environments, like uh, factory automation lines and things like that. And they haven't really had much impact in operating in kind of messy real world environments because those environments are so varied that it's hard for the robot to really perceive and understand enough to do the right thing given a you know, slightly different environment than it's familiar with. 
but machine learning will enable us to, to be able to have robots that do this. And so one thing you want to be able to do to a robot is to impart new, new tasks and skills to it quickly. And so here you see some, some early work on enabling robots to learn from you know, short video clips of humans doing things and then learn to emulate that. Uh, on the left, it's kind of just hand motions. On the right, it's actually humans pouring stuff into different kinds of cups or vessels. Uh, and the robotic system gets you know, about 10 clips of people pouring things and then gets to use a reinforcement learning based algorithm to practice pouring for about 10 minutes. And so at the end of 10 minutes, the robot has effectively learned to pour maybe at the four-year-old human level, probably not at the eight-year-old human level yet, but you know, that is a pretty difficult skill to think about writing a hand-coded algorithm for, but with learning, the system can actually pick this up from just examples and, and trial and error. So that's pretty exciting as well. The field of health, I think, is going to be dramatically transformed by machine learning. Um, and I will walk you through a particular example, but kind of keep in the back of your mind, there's lots and lots of problems like this in health. So one of the things we hope to be able to do with machine learning is to bring world-class specialist expertise to everyone at lower cost. And you know, access to quality healthcare is a really big problem around the world. And so I will use diabetic retinopathy as an example of this kind of approach. So diabetic retinopathy is the fastest growing cause of preventable blindness in the world. And screening can prevent blindness. Basically, if you catch this disease in time, you can effectively treat it and prevent blindness. But if you don't catch it in time, then many patients suffer full or partial vision loss before they're treated, and, uh, diagnosed and treated. Um, and so for example, in India, there's a shortage of more than 100,000 eye doctors because you actually need some specialty eye, training, eye doctor training in order to do this sort of assessment and, and uh, screening. And therefore, 45% of patients lose vision before they're actually diagnosed. Um, and it turns out the same kinds of machine learning algorithms that can learn from general images and predict one of you know, thousands of categories can actually be trained on retinal images and predict one of five different categorical labels, one, two, three, four, or five, that diabetic retinopathy is graded on. Um, and so if you get a bunch of retinal images, you get them labeled in a, uh, by board-certified ophthalmologists, uh, and you have enough of them, then you can essentially use the same machine learning model architecture, train it on retinal images, and get a model that is quite accurate at predicting the right category, one, two, three, four, or five, for a new retinal image. Um, and this is work that was published at the end of 2016 in JAMA by our, our health research group, uh, basically showing that with that approach, you can get an algorithm that is on par or perhaps slightly better than the median board-certified ophthalmologist at this task. Um, we'd like to actually do even better. And so there's a uh, kind of doctor called a retinal specialist that has a lot more training in retinal disease. And so it turns out if you get the, the data set labeled by retinal specialists rather than uh, people who are more generalists, you actually get better quality labels and you can train the system on those specialist labeled images and get to an even better outcome. So now you have a model, a model that is on par with retinal specialists, which is kind of the gold standard of care uh, in, this, in this space. Um, and that's something that can be easily used in many, many, many different places all around the world. Explainability is one aspect of these systems that often neural networks get a bit of a, a bad rap for. You know, they're thought to be kind of uninterpretable black boxes. But there's actually been a fair amount of progress in this space in the last few years of trying to make in, uh, uh, predictions made by neural networks more interpretable. And so in the diabetic retinopathy example, for example, uh, you'd like to see, um, like a doctor would like to see why does the system think this particular retinal image is a two and not a three. And so for example, with moderate diabetic retinopathy, we can have the system visualize what parts of the image are most important or most contributing to the prediction of two instead of three and allow the clinician to actually look at this and sort of get more confidence and, and sort of intuitive understanding of why the system is, is predicting that, making that prediction. And there's been a bunch of work on general 
uh, interpretability and explainability for neural networks that has been uh, really important for making them usable in scenarios where you actually do need kind of some form of explainability and interpretability. There's a bunch of other things in the healthcare space that I think are pretty interesting and exciting. So for example, machine learning to interpret uh, CT scans to help detect lung cancer, being able to make predictions on medical records, actually ironically using similar kinds of models to what we're using to do English to French translation, where you have an English sentence and then conditioned on that, you wanna predict the French sentence. Similarly, you can take the first part of a medical record and try to predict the rest of the medical record or different attributes of a medical record. So can you predict from a de-identified medical record, is this patient likely to develop diabetes in the next 12 months? Or what diagnosis makes sense given the symptoms the patient is reporting in their past medical history? And then can we use speech recognition and text summarization to help make it easier for clinicians to write sort of the, the kinds of notes they put into medical records more easily so that they can spend more time with patients and less time sort of fiddling with the EMR note-taking system. Speaking of text, uh, a lot of advances here depend on being able to better understand text. And uh, there's been a bunch of recent improvements uh, in sort of text modeling approaches that have been uh, pretty impactful. So one of them was uh, some work by a set of Google researchers uh, who created something called the transformer model in this original paper called Attention is All You Need in 2017. Um, and this kind of was a pretty big leap forward in the capabilities of language understanding. Uh, I'll also point out that this paper is number four on Nature's 2020 list of most influential scientific papers published between 2015 and 2020. Um, as an aside, the first four papers are all machine learning related. It's not until you get to number five that there's a non-machine learning related paper in all the scientific papers that were most influential in the last five years. So uh, machine learning is sweeping the scientific community. Um, the thing about the transformer model is it enables text to be processed in a way that is different than the previous state-of-the-art recurrent models. So recurrent models are ones that sort of take input one token at a, at a time and have some internal state. And so they look at the next token, they do some computation to update their internal state, and then they can move on to the next token. And this sequential, an inherently sequential process of the recurrence relation is such that it's very hard to make them perform extremely well or to process very long sequences of text. And the transformer model essentially frees us from that and enables us to process all the tokens in some input in parallel and then use an attention mechanism to look backwards at any of the previous tokens that we want. And so we get much higher accuracy for some couple of language translation types, English to German and English to French as shown here, measured in blue score, which measures translation quality. And we do so with 10x to 100x less computation than the training costs of those previous state-of-the-art recurrent models of various kinds. In 2018, a different team of uh, Google researchers built on, on the transformer work and came up with a clever way of using not just things to the left, but the entire context surrounding some piece of, of text in order to make predictions about that text. Uh, so this is called a bi-directional encoder representation from transformers because it's able to use the entire context uh, that is known in order to solve language tasks. And so the way it's trained is a little bit like Mad Libs. If you remember Mad Libs when you were a kid, you essentially take some text, and there's a lot of text in the world. You randomly just drop 15% of the words or so. And so now we have these blanks, and we're going to train the model to try to fill in the blanks from the other information that it does have, which is the surrounding context. And this is actually pretty hard. If you look at one of these blanks and try to guess what word is in the blank, you know, you have some vague notion that it might be one of these five or 10 words, but it's often uh, pretty hard to figure out exactly what word it is. But that's the task the model is given in order to try to get it to understand contextual language. And so by doing that, you effectively now have the model try to guess the missing words, which are up at the top there, uh, from the rest of the context. And the key, this is a really important thing because that's step one. And pre-training the model on this fill-in-the-blank task using lots and lots and lots of text. Remember, you don't have to label this text because text just exists in the world, and you just need to drop 15% of it in order to do this task. Um, then you can use that model, that pre-representation that has been trained 
to then fine tune the model on a bunch of different specific tasks where you may have very small amounts of data. So maybe you want to predict, you know, given some restaurant review, can you predict, is this going to be a, a vegetarian restaurant? Um, and maybe that's, you have a few hundred examples of that. Uh, and that, uh, but using the step one pre-training, you often can get very high quality with very few examples of that. And so that's been responsible for major improvements in Google Translate. So that green jump on all these different languages shown in the x-axis and blue score shown in the y-axis uh, is uh, BERT is partly responsible for that. We switched over to a BERT-based translation model. Um, one of the other challenges in that list of NAE challenges was engineer the tools for scientific discovery. So I'll highlight a couple of different kinds of tools. So one is, can we automate more of the machine learning process? And in order to do that, uh, let's look at this. So we have the current way you solve a machine learning problem is you have some human machine learning expert uh, sit down, they have some data, and they have some computation, and they run a whole bunch of experiments, and then they hopefully come up with a solution. So the problem is there aren't that many uh, people in the world with machine learning expertise to solve problems. And so if we could actually turn this into something where the machine is able to replace human machine learning expertise with kind of automated exploration of possible solutions, you might be able to turn this into something more like data plus computation to run lots of experiments and algorithms that interpret the results of those experiments in order to come up with solutions. And so uh, if you look at this line of work, uh, some of the earliest work that our groups have been doing in this space uh, is called neural architecture search. And so one of the decisions a human machine learning expert makes when they're deciding to solve a problem of machine learning is what model structure should they use? If it's a computer vision model, should they use a 17-layer model or a 15-layer model? Should it have 3 by 3 filters or 5 by 5 filters at layer 9? There's all kinds of decisions that are being made. And so the idea is we can have a model-generating model that generates a description of a model. And so we can generate a whole bunch of models using that model-generating model. We can train them for a few hours. And then we can use the loss, the accuracy of these generated models to steer the model generating model towards the kinds of models that seem to work better and away from the kinds of models that didn't seem to work as well. And then we can repeat this process. So we repeat it a lot. And eventually, the model generating model gets very good at generating model structures and model architectures for the particular problem we're actually trying to solve. Um, and it gets quite good, in fact. So if you look at this complicated diagram, I will walk you through it. So, on the y-axis, we have accuracy for the ImageNet challenge that I mentioned earlier. Uh, higher is better. On the x-axis, we have floating point operations needed to do uh, one classification for an image. And generally, what you see is a trend that different models, which are represented by dots here, uh, the more computation you spend, the higher the accuracy gets. Uh, that's a general trend in machine learning. And the things on the dotted gray line Pareto frontier here are all kind of human ML expert generated models that advanced the state of the art in computer vision at the time they were released um, by basically the top computer vision and machine learning researchers in the world. So that's the dotted gray line. And the, oops, the auto ML work uh, in 2017 showed that you can actually get significantly better results and for less computation cost, you can either choose same accuracy, way less computation cost, or you can choose higher accuracy um, with this AutoML approach. And with a further set of advancements, the AutoML work in 2019 showed that you can actually get much, much better results. So this is sort of showing that automated experimentation by machine learning models can actually give dramatically better results than the world's machine learning experts. And it's true in image recognition here, it's true in object detection, which is another computer vision task. So the ML expert models are down here. The auto ML experts, uh, auto ML derived models are here. Um, and it's true in language translation. So we can give the system the transformer model and we can give it kind of the basic uh, components of the transformer model and let it sort of assemble them like tinker toys in slightly different ways and get substantially more accurate uh, translation models. 
And I'll touch on computational power. So deep learning is really transforming how we think about designing computers. And the re there are two reasons for this. The first is that neural networks and deep learning have these special computational properties. So first is that reduced precision is fine. Actually, it's perfectly OK to carry out the computations to just like one or two decimal digits of precision, not six or seven. And so that means that you can pack more multipliers into the same chip area. And the second is that all of the operations, I've, uh, the systems I've described, are all composed of different, different orderings and compositions of the same kind of handful of specific operations, things like matrix multiplies, uh, vector dot products, essentially linear algebra operations of various kinds. And so if we can basically design computers that are good at reduced precision linear algebra and nothing else, those are going to be amazing for machine learning because we can, for example, pack more multipliers into the same chip area and not have to worry about all the general purpose computational uh, apparatus that are present in sort of a, a modern CPU, say. And so we've been doing this kind of specialized uh, machine learning accelerator work for quite a while. Uh, and we've been uh, kind of called this line of work tensor processing units because they're very good at operating on tensors, doing essentially low precision linear algebra. Um, we've had three generations of these things uh, that are sort of impressively useful for large scale training. Uh, the latter two generations have been designed for training and are designed to be connected together in these large networks uh, called pods. Uh, with sort of custom interconnect architecture um, that's a 2D toroidal mesh. Uh, and the, for example, the third generation pod is more than 100 petaflops of computation. So it's essentially a machine learning supercomputer uh, that we can use to tackle lots of different kinds of problems. OK, I want to close with two things. One is a vision for where I think we could go. So what do we want? I think we want a large model that is sparsely activated. Like it's really important to let a model have very large capacity, but it needs to be able to remember lots of different things. And most of the things it remembers are not necessarily going to be relevant to each thing it's trying to do. So if I'm good at classifying garbage trucks, that's not going to be that relevant when I'm trying to like figure out uh, how Shakespeare might might have finished the sentence. And so can we build a model that is got large capacity? but is only activating the parts of the model that make sense for a particular task. I think we want a single model to solve many, many tasks. Most of the models we train today are one task or maybe five or 10 tasks, but not hundreds or millions of different tasks. So how do we build a system that enables us to solve many, many tasks at once? I think we want to dynamically change the structure of the model in the same way that the AutoML search process can help find you know, effective model architectures. We want to be able to learn what are interesting pieces of the model? Where do we want to grow it? Where do we want to shrink it? Uh, and adapting is needed to those new tasks. OK, so I have a cartoonish diagram of how this might look. Let's say we have a, a large model that can solve a bunch of tasks already, and it's figured out some of these pieces of the model are relevant to some tasks, and some are relevant to other tasks. And it's made up of all these components. So component is some piece of a machine learning model with some state, with some operations. Um, and then a new task comes along. So now we have a purple task. And we'd like to be able to get into a good state for this task. So we can imagine running some sort of neural architecture search-like process to find interesting paths th through the model that get us into a good state using some of these pre-trained components. So maybe this path gets us into a good state for the purple task. But maybe we care a lot about this ac the accuracy of this task. So the system could automatically add capacity for this new task uh, and start to use it and train it so that it gets even better at accomplishing that task. And now that component is available for solving new tasks or even use in solving the existing tasks perhaps even better than they've been solved. Finally, thoughtful use of AI in society. I think. One of the things about machine learning is it can be applied to so many different problems that it's really important to have a framing of how we want to think about which problems we should apply it to and which ones we should not. And this is why I'm really excited that in a couple of years ago, as we started to think more about machine learning and its use in our products, uh, we came up with a set of principles by which we, we think about uh, applying machine learning to different problems. And I think it's really important 
to highlight, for example, avoid creating or reinforcing unfair bias. You know, a lot of times machine learning models are trained on data about the world as it is, not data about the world as we'd like it to be. And so that can even perpetuate biases that already exist in the real world from, say, human biases that are present in the data. Uh, and many other of these, many other principles here. I'd like to point out, though, that many of these areas are vibrant areas of research. So we have some set of best practices that we understand so far, but we'd like to improve those. And so we're continuing to do research in sort of new techniques to avoid bias or to make sure that machine learning systems are safe and so on. Um, and with that, I will conclude and tell you that I think deep neural networks and machine learning are really going to help make headway on some of the world's grand challenges. Uh, you know, some of the ones I outlined in this talk, but many others besides. Uh, and I'd like to thank you for your attention and tell you that we're hiring. Uh, we also are hiring uh, lots of different kinds of, of new graduates. Uh, so uh, with that, I will conclude and answer questions. Thank you. Thanks so much, Jeff. We're going to dive right into questions. And our first question will be from Hao Young. Hi, Jeff. Thank you for joining us today. Um, in your opinion, what are the key bottlenecks that we need to break, break through before we see the next wave of AI innovation, like the one brought by deep learning? Yeah, good question. Thank you. Uh, I mean, I think the, the thing I was sketching out at the end of the talk, where we want to have a single model that can solve many, many tasks. Because I think the way we're solving machine learning problems today is we typically are starting from nothing, right? We collect some data set of a problem we care about. We initialize the parameters of a machine learning model completely from a random number generator. Uh, and then we start training the model on the task we care about on the data set we've collected. Um, and this is crazy, right? This is sort of like forgetting your entire education whenever you solve a new thing. And so I think if we can actually build these models that can do many things and can have different kinds of expertise that they can leverage and bring to bear on new problems, that will really be a pretty significant advance forward. Because we know that when you are able to do that, you know, in the bird example, you have this large pre-trained system. And then with just a handful of examples, you can learn to do a new task. So if we can do that for all machine learning tasks, and so that you need 10 or 100 examples, not 10,000, that would make pretty dramatic improvements, I think. Thank you That's for the really exciting. Thanks. Awesome. Our next question is from Yash. <clears throat> hey, Jeff. It's great to meet you, actually. Um, my question for you is, how do you advise undergrad students that are passionate about deep learning to gain credibility? And I guess more importantly, get involved with real world impact research such as Google's, especially when the industry is normalizing, exclusively recruiting uh, PhD and master degree candidates. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I would not say we are exclusively uh, recruiting only master's and PhD students for researchy roles. Um, it definitely helps to have research experience. And one way to do that is to get a master's or PhD. But I do think having undergrads get involved in research early uh, so if you're an undergrad and are excited about this kind of stuff, go talk to a faculty member or two and say, hey, I really like the kind of work you're doing. Is there something I can do to help out? I think that's one way. The other is to kind of follow the research uh, literature in the parts of machine learning or in whatever topic you're interested in uh, and what kind of developments are happening there. Happening there. That will serve you well, both as giving you a background in uh, you know, what's happening. Also, if you do want to eventually go to grad school, then you can sort of like use that in your, your, your sort of essays that you, you write. You can sort of talk uh, more eloquently about uh, existing work that's happening and what you, why you're excited about it. Um, one thing I kind of tell students of all different levels is that, you know, one of the things that I found helpful in my career is to be able to connect lots of different ideas together to bring to bear on a new problem. And so I often say that it's kind of actually helpful to skim 10 papers instead of reading one in depth. You know, sometimes you need to read one in depth because it's like very related to something you're doing, but skimming 10 papers is almost always better than reading one in deep detail and maybe even reading 100 abstracts. 
Because what you want is a sense of what things are possible and how they might connect. And you can always go back and get more details about this once you know that that is a possibility. So I think that's kind of a good way to like get an overall framing of a lot of different kinds of areas. And then obviously sometimes when you're doing research, you do need to go very deeply in the one area. Thanks for the question. Absolutely, thank you. Next up, we have Josh. Thanks so much for your time. Um, in deciding what research directions you pursue at Google, how do you balance funding projects that will probably have immediate payoff, uh, that will probably have immediate returns with high payoffs versus long racing projects that may be high risk, low return in nature? Yeah, this is a good question. I mean, I think one way I like to think about it is there's this continuum between research and engineering, right? It's not a black and white kind of hard boundary between them. Uh, and sometimes you can have shorter term projects that you're pretty sure are gonna work out and there's some details to be worked out, but they reasonably are going to provide you know, a good outcome. And then there's other ones that are much longer term and you're not really sure is this gonna work out. So for those longer term ones, I usually like to look at the problem and what you're trying to accomplish and try to figure out if the best possible outcome happens in this project, will the world be different in some way? Like if the world is only going to be a tiny bit different from some long-term project, that may not be ambitious enough, right? You may want to be picking a problem where it is high risk. You're not sure it's going to work out and there's a lot of unknowns, but where if they do work out, that something fundamentally different will happen. And I think that's kind of a good framing of how you balance the long-term risk reward ratio with shorter term engineering things. If you're doing a project where nearly every detail is sort of, you squint at it, you're like, yeah, I know how to solve that. That's more engineering. That's not to say it's a bad idea to do, but I think you do want a continuum of different kinds of work. You know, if you're running a research lab as I am, you want a portfolio of these kinds of things. Uh, you want some very long-term ambitious things. You want some shorter term things that are more researchy, but, but are more, likely to work out with high payoff. Thank you for the Thank question. Thank you so much. Thanks yep. so much for answering. And lastly, we have Ashka. I think you're muted, Ashka. Oh, yes. Uh, hi, Jeff. It's really nice to get to talk to you. Um, so my question for you would be, what kind of problems would you want PhD students doing systems plus ML work to focus on? Yeah, good question. I mean, I think that is a really exciting kind of confluence of areas. Uh, and I, I would characterize it as two different kinds of problem sets. There's the uh, machine learning applied to systems problems. And then there's computer systems work applied to machine learning systems. Uh, and th those are a little bit different in flavor. I think machine learning applied to systems is a super interesting area because a lot of computer systems are just loaded with heuristics about when to do this or that. If you think about like cache replacement, you know, LRU is sort of a heuristic. If you think about, you know, index uh, creation for databases, there's very specific algorithms that work well for all kinds of distributions of data but don't take advantage of the actual data you're storing in the database. Uh, and so I think there's all kinds of opportunities to bring learning to make systems more adaptive to the kinds of things they're trying to do. So can you learn better cache replacement policies online for a system because you now know the stream of requests as opposed to having to build an algorithm that works in general for all kinds of request streams. Um, and I think that's one example. I think. In the other direction, in systems for ML, you know, there's a lot of interesting work in computer architecture, in how do you express software systems that make it easy to express machine learning algorithms and can you know, scale to very large training systems or, or inference systems. Uh, so all of those areas are interesting. I think it kind of depends a little bit on your personal passion and which one you're more excited about. I think the, the, the ML for computer systems is much less explored at the moment. Thank you. Thank you. And I think we have just a little bit more time. I'm wondering if Jeff could maybe take a little bit of time to tell us a little bit about his career journey and some of the key oh. maybe 
key steps that helped get you to where you are today? Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, yeah, so I had a bit of an unusual childhood. I went to 11 schools in 12 years in lots of different places around the world. Uh, but I got introduced to computing when my dad uh, bought a kit computer that he soldered together in the back of, that he saw an ad for in the back of the magazine. Um, and so I knew from like age 10 on that I really enjoyed programming and problem solving. I think the iteration time that you get when you have some code, you make some changes to it, you press compile, and all of a sudden your new thing is running and you've changed the behavior of, of something you previously had in you know a few seconds. Uh, I get frustrated whenever I try to do physical or mechanical things because the cycle times are much longer. Um, and so I, I went to uh, undergraduate um, majoring in computer science, and then I added an econ degree because I took some econ classes, and I took some more, and I took some more, and they were interested too. Um, and then I was uh, doing some work between undergraduate and grad school on um, sort of uh, modeling software for the HIV and AIDS uh, pandemic in the World Health Organization. Um, and uh, that, that has sort of been a, a nice reminder of the current COVID situation. You know, HIV and COVID are very different, but the similar kinds of modeling techniques can be used to sort of try to assess what is the likely future you know, uh, progression of a pandemic, um, which was what we were trying to do with the HIV AIDS pandemic. And then I decided I would go to graduate school and get a PhD in computer science because I felt like that was more practical than econ, which was the other thing I was considering. Um, and then when I finished grad school, I was sort of debating, should I be a faculty member or should I work in an industrial research lab? And I decided to work in an industrial research lab because I really liked sort of uh, doing hands-on work myself. And I felt as a faculty member, I might not get ch a chance to do that as much because you're really trying to do three jobs as a faculty member. Uh, and I wanted to do more on the research side. Uh, I do like teaching, so I kind of missed out on that, I guess. But uh, and then I was working in an industrial research lab for about two and a half years and got a little frustrated with the large company size. And so I decided to um, do what everyone living in Silicon Valley does, thinks about at some point, which is join a small company. Uh, so I joined Google when we were about 25 people. Uh, we were wedged in a little second floor area above a, what's now a T-Mobile store in downtown Palo Alto. I was in a very small office, and my two other office mates and I would have to agree on who was going to roll their chair back uh, kind of first in order to stand up because we couldn't all do it at the same time. Um, and then over time, you know, uh, I've gotten to work on a lot of different problems at Google, and I really have enjoyed kind of the bringing together of a set of people to tackle a particular problem where lots of different people have different kinds of expertise and you need all of those kinds of expertise to come together to solve the problem and no one of you could solve the problem individually uh, because i think that's a really good situation to put yourself in throughout your career is how do you bring something to a problem but where you also get something out of it by learning from other people who were working on the problem together uh, and I, I feel like then you kind of some of your knowledge rubs off on on them, some of their knowledge rubs off on you and you all go your separate ways. Uh, but you wanna kind of continue learning throughout your uh, you know, uh, career, whatever it might be, a research career, an engineering career, uh, you wanna keep uh, doing new things. And the more things you have, you kind of have this giant tool belt of techniques now. And now you have all the tools you need to solve the next problem except for maybe one, you wanna then work on something where you then pick up another tool. So, I got that one. A whirlwind tour. The whirlwind tour of, of AI and ML and of Jeff's background. Um, so thank you so much. Thank you to UT for hosting. And thank you to Jeff for, for this wonderful talk. Thank you to our students who gave their time to, to send questions in and, and to share them today. Um, so thanks, everybody. Yeah, thank you all. Stay healthy, stay safe. <laughs>